some of the early archaeological uh, indicators of rituals and religion uh, in early prehistory. And then what I would really like to concentrate on are the developments in the Upper Paleolithic. Um, I think that uh, they are only under these changes that we get in the Upper Paleolithic, I think are only understandable in terms of uh, changes that happen with complex hunting and gathering societies. And I'll talk about the ind archeological indicators for that complexity. And also the role of what I call aggrandizers and their strategies, uh, which I think are promoting a lot of these changes. And one of the um, strategies I think that they use were secret societies, which I think is a pivotal, pivotal development in the development of uh, religion over, the to over time. And then I'll just talk briefly about the evidence for uh, secret societies in the Upper Paleolithic. Okay, so that is the, I'm not sure why this, okay. Um, so, um, Going right back to the beginning, uh, the initial ecstatic experiences, what I call sacred ecstatic experiences. Um, as I mentioned uh, just a minute ago, these euphoric states uh, are generally uh, created under uh, conditions of stress or toxicity. Some of the chemicals that we ingest are technically toxic. Uh, psychedelic uh, uh, chemicals that we get from plants. Um, and the, the basic question I think uh, is whether these, these states are adaptive or whether they just represent some sort of a breakdown in the biological system um, and sort of that uh, you just, everything is disassociating, uh, disconnecting, et cetera. Um, especially under conditions of starvation and exhaustion, pain, and high stress. And I, I think we can make a good argument that uh, these euphoric states enable uh, people to transcend the pain, to transcend starvation conditions and exhaustion, and that this would in fact have a very strong survival uh, adaptive advantage. Um, so I think that is the, the origin of these numinous experiences that are really at the foundation of ritual, um, ritual experiences that we have and, and religions ultimately, uh, or at least it's one of the foundations. Um, and the techniques that are still used for inducing altered states of consciousness uh, uh, in, tri in traditional societies very much rely on exhaustion, starvation, uh, and pain to induce these experiences, these euphoric experiences. So, um, so I think that there is a connection here between basic biological um, adaptations and survival and these euphoric experiences. Um, and I, I need to, emphasize that um, there is wide variation within the human species populations about people's susceptibility. Some people are very susceptible to entering into these states and others are much less so. Um, and what I would like to suggest here is that these experiences were used initially to validate claims about the supernatural, supernatural forces, as well as supernatural sanctions uh, dealing with uh, the necessity for bonding, ritual bonding, uh, for sharing, uh, ritual sharing, for uh, concepts of healing, especially the socially uh, mediated uh, techniques for healing. Uh, they were used for validating claims about totemic ancestors, uh, the need for initiations, etc. And all this goes uh, down to the basic need for some sort of bonding mechanism if you're going to have a social adaptation. And, and human hunters and gatherers are above all social 
um, social, they use society, social relationships as adaptations to get access to the resources, to get support in times of stress for all sorts of things. And so maintaining this social bonding, I think is ultimately uh, what is behind the use of these numinous experiences to validate the claims that are being made to, to make sure that people um, adhere to the social and, and the ritual mandates of the society. I, this is shades of Durkheim for sure, but I think it's also modern, um, you know, social um, biological evolutionary theory too. Um, so I think that's the origin. I mean, that's my take on the origin of these things. And, and we have a timeline here that uh, you may be familiar with if you looked at the book on shamans, sorcerers and saints um, of, you know, the early up lower Paleolithic here, uh, concepts of the soul, generalized rituals and ecstatic initiations. And then uh, about 100,000 years ago, we start getting evidence for animal cults. We'll look at that in a second. Um, maybe some indications for shamanism. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes back a little bit further here, but there's no definite indications. Uh, then with the upper Paleolithic, we do definitely get, I think, um, I'm convinced we get secret societies emerging, uh, fertility cults and ancestor cults. Um, so, whoops, sorry. Oh, went, uh, uh, sorry, jumping around here. <laughs> so just very briefly, um, some of the evidence for animal cults are uh, going back into the lower Paleolithic. We have at Lazare, uh, this wolf skull at the top, which was left in the entrance to a hut. Uh, at the cave in Lazare, uh, at Regordou on the bottom right. Here we have uh, going back over uh, about 100,000 years ago in Neanderthal times, um, a burial, which is on the left here. And then right next to it, we have um, in this area here, uh, a walled enclosure with a large slab covering it with a bear. Uh, buried in it uh, right next to this human burial over here. Um, and so I think this is good ev evidence for uh, uh, bear cults. And then in the upper Paleolithic Chauvet, we have bear skulls placed on rocks, uh, et cetera. So I th think there's good evidence for uh, some sort of animal cults. And then general rituals uh, at the site of Brunichel, um, we have this, uh, this structure of broken stalagmites and stalactites uh, that's um, over 170,000 years old uh, and a smaller structure here with a hearth in the middle, hearth in the side. Um, it's, there are no animal, well, there is uh, some bare bones, but uh, there's no evidence um, for um, honoring a, any animals at, at this site at, this, at present. So we can say that this is some sort of general ritual, perhaps with initiations. Um, so basically that's what we have uh, it, up until the upper Paleolithic, uh, very quick, very, very uh, uh, schematic overview. Uh, and so what I would like to really concentrate on, as I mentioned, are the developments in the upper Paleolithic uh, and why they occurred. So, uh, we definitely get some indications of shamanism, whether it's you want to call it proto-shamanism. People argue about the definitions of shamanism all the time, uh, or we can call it shamanistic indicators, if you like. Uh, we also get some fertility cults, evidence for those, and ancestral cults. And then down here, the, the big one that I would like to talk most about are the secret societies. So uh, why, did, why did all these things start occurring uh, in the upper Paleolithic? This is a major issue of contention today. Um, and I constantly arguing with some of the French colleagues about it. Um, others are 
more receptive to some of these ideas. But, but the standard view was that a uh, new species came in, Neanderthals were stupid, they didn't have any symbolic thought, they couldn't, uh, they didn't have forethought, they didn't have speech, they couldn't put two and two together. Um, and this new species came in, Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, from the Near East uh, with symbolic thought and the ability to produce um, art and uh, blades and carve uh, stone and carve uh, ivory and antler. And that's when all these things, they brought all these things with them because they were a, a, a more um, modern, more symbolic thinking kind of species. Um, I don't think so. Um, the, the take that I would like to, um, well, let me go through some of the indicators here first before I get into my take on this. Um, so the shaman, shamanic elements that we get in the Upper Paleolithic are numerous uh, depictions of transformed or theranthropic uh, uh, animal human um, kinds of beings. Um, whether these are masks or whether they are uh, conceptual transformations that were experiential is an open question, but certainly there's uh, some sort of uh, identity going on. Uh, and some of these are clearly mythical kinds of creatures. Um, <clears throat> we also get uh, indications of the use of drums, which are a shamanic element uh, throughout most of the world. Uh, or a good part of the world, at any rate, in the northern hemisphere, uh, drum sticks uh, for hoop drums uh, found at Gargas. And then a number of authors have argued that the paintings in the caves and the use of the caves uh, basically were um, shamanic developments, Shama shamans going into the caves, having experiences, altered states of consciousness, and, uh, and leaving records of those. So, I think there's fairly good evidence for the shamanic elements. Um, once again, uh, rigor do, but we get a big increase in, in burials in the upper Paleolithic, uh, only 200 of them, and it's a big increase from Neanderthal times. But the question is, uh, we've only got 200 burials for the entire upper Paleolithic. Where are the rest of the people? And why were some people buried and some people not? Well. The, um, one of the obvious suggestions is that uh, there were key important ancestors or people in ancestral cults, uh, families that were higher up in the ancestral hierarchy uh, who were more important and who got buried. Uh, they may have also been high status individuals, uh, high ritual individuals, but I think there are some good indications for ancestors ancestral uh, veneration. Uh, I think it was Paul Pettit who argued that the, um, the use of bones, the recycling of human bones uh, basically is the same in the Neolithic as it is in the upper Paleolithic. And certainly in the Neolithic, we get a lot of uh, ancestral indications of ancestral worship. Uh, we get the uh, lots of evidence for fertility cults uh, I'm sure you're familiar with these. Um, and, and so we come, so we've got evidence for these things. The main thing is how do we explain them? Um, and I would, I think that they are all basically related to the development of what I would call complex hunting and gathering societies. Um, up until fairly recently, the Upper Paleolithic had been portrayed as and interpreted as uh, a societies that were of simple hunters and gatherers, uh, similar to what we get in among the Kong and the and the San in Southern Africa or the Australian Aborigines, for the most part. Um, so these are what we can call simple hunters and gatherers. In contrast. Uh, and that's on the left here. Um, and this is uh, uh, supported by Testart and 
Leon Devore and Boulistan and Darmanjat in uh, France, there is a very strong uh, contingent that supports this view of uh, hunting and gathering societies in the Upper Paleolithic. In contrast, we also have complex hunters and gatherers, uh, such as the ones on the Northwest coast here in British Columbia, uh, also in the Northwest interior, uh, which are portrayed down here, which have elaborate clothing and a uh, fair amount of wealth and a much more complex kind of society with inequalities and, uh, and wealth and poverty in the societies. And this is the view that I take of what Upper Paleolithic societies was like in favored locations in Southwestern Europe and in Eastern Europe as well. Um, and so this is an economic view of why these changes are taking place or a, a political economic or political ecological view. So uh, and these are some of the people that uh, adhere to a more complex view of what was happening. So just to go over this very quickly, the economic base for simple hunters and gatherers are that they have very limited and vulnerable resources. They fluctuate all the time. They're very nomadic. Um, they don't have any long-term storage. They are as egalitarian as we can find societies. They have obligatory sharing uh, in order to, for everybody to survive. The emphasis is on the group and they, they don't have any resource-based competition. Okay, in contrast to that, these more complex hunters and gatherers have abundant resources uh, and usually produce some surpluses. Uh, they are more sedentary. They have mass harvests and kills. They have storage for the most part, long-term and surpluses, and they've got socioeconomic inequalities um, and resource-based competition. Okay, so two very different views of what the Upper Paleolithic was like. So just uh, very briefly, uh, archeologically, this is the site of Le Solutre over here on the left, piles of, of horse bones. Uh, there were also a lot of salmon being caught in the Upper Paleolithic and reindeer, of course. Um, we have evidence for sedentism and uh, a much an increased level of sedentary, at least seasonal sedentism, sometimes um, more. Uh, we also have evidence for uh, mass harvests and drying of, of meat in the Upper Paleolithic and the storage. Um, the, here we have storage pits up in some of the Eastern European um, uh, sites. This is a shelter surrounded by four storage pits. We get other storage pits, same thing here, same thing over here. Um, but in, in some areas, we don't get very many storage pits. And so the question is, well, did they, did they have storage? In fact, if you look at the Northern hemisphere, most of the storage is ethnographically is in, are in these little uh, structures that are elevated on stilts above the ground so that bears and other predators can't get at them. Uh, and that's the vast majority of storage. And I think this is probably typical of the Upper Paleolithic as well. We also get Upper Paleolithic in inequalities, some very good indications of those, and wealth. This is the site of Songir in, in Russia, where you have thousands of ivory beads that are decorating these uh, these buried individuals, some two adolescents in the bottom and one adult in the middle. Uh, each one of those beads took an hour to produce at least. Uh, we can look at the grave goods and see that there are, you know, measure the levels of inequality even on the burials. We also get uh, very elaborate counting systems in the Upper Paleolithic uh, into the hundreds and thousands of marks on bones. Uh, those don't exist among simple hunters and gatherers. They have their numbering systems almost never go above 10 or 20. 
Um, so basically, uh, what I'd like to argue uh, is that there are no indications of inequality until the upper Paleolithic. And then we start getting all of these indicators. We get the rich resources, the storage, the rich clothing, the rich burials, um, major differences in, in wealth. Uh, it's estimated that uh, making the beads for the people in Sangir that were buried would have entailed 10,000 hours of labor to produce. Um, so, how do we explain some of these developments in the Upper Paleolithic? And if we accept that the, that the, um, that there were inequalities and there were these occasional surpluses at least and abundant, sur abundant resources, um, what I would like to suggest is that some individuals began to say, well, we don't need all this insurance of sharing everything. And, uh, and so they began to start promoting their own self-interests. And they developed a number of strategies to do this, to convince other people to uh, buy into their strategies. And these are the people I would call aggrandizers. Uh, they're people that always are trying to promote their own self-interests, even and even if they are detrimental to other people, something that would have been anathema among simple hunters and gatherers. Um, but with complex hunting and gathering groups like the ones in California and the Northwest Coast here, Northwest Interior, uh, the Ainu of Japan, uh, the Calusa of Florida and many others, um, with these groups that are still hunters and gatherers, we get inequalities, we get wealthy families, we get individuals. Uh, and typically, they, these individuals have developed strategies for using surpluses to uh, develop greater power bases and increase their benefits. So the strategies that I've identified that uh, these ambitious people use are feasting, uh, which entails debts, uh, because uh, there are uh, gifts that are given at feasts and these have to be returned. Uh, bride prices, bride prices do not benefit anybody but the rich. Uh, there are the contractual debts and related to feasting, but also loans. Uh, the creation of prestige items that are used in very special social situation like marriages and alliances. Um, the recognition of ownership, which does not occur with simple hunting and gathering societies, so that, private ownership, family ownership. Um, but we start getting that with complex hunting and gathering societies ethnographically. Uh, we also get increases in warfare over wealth. Um, taboos and fines I won't go into, uh, it's uh, too much of a tangent. Um, and then most importantly for our, our present uh, discussion is access to the supernatural. Uh, and these, um, the access to the super, so all these strategies are used to benefit uh, individuals. And this is a uh, secret society hut in California here that uh, looks like a cave almost, but it's artificial among the wind twin. Um, so on to the, um, well, the indications of some of these strategies in the upper Paleolithic, we get these uh, prestige objects that are made and very costly in terms of time and effort. Uh, we get bride prices, uh, this, these are ethnographic, um, but uh, children are invested with wealth in order to get them to, uh, in order to increase their value for marriage. Uh, I would suggest that that's why we get so many uh, child burials with wealth in the Upper Paleolithic. Uh, the Madeleine uh, alone had over 1,000 dentalium shells uh, from the coast, uh, which was very far away at that time. 
and um, and each of those would have been very expensive. Uh, we get good evidence for feasts in the Upper Paleolithic, um, and then uh, and there are other indications as well. But I don't have time to go over all of them. So that just gives you a, a a highlight of some of the more important ones. To come back to the control of access to the supernatural powers. Uh, this can be done through ancestor cults, which uh, require a lot of feasts and a lot of paraphernalia, and the people at the highest level of the uh, lineage or the clan are the ones in the most power, uh, have the most power. And then uh, secret societies, uh, which we're getting to very shortly here. <laughs> um, so the secret societies. Uh, for, I'd like to make a couple of observations. They're fairly common among complex hunting and gathering societies uh, like California, like the Northwest Coast, like the Northwest Interior, uh, and maybe other areas that we don't have as much information on. Uh, but archaeologists have neglected these um, for whatever reason. Uh, and I think they're a critical link between uh, ritual and political economic power um, in these societies. So as a working definition, we can say that they are associations in which membership or certainly membership in the upper ranks is exclusive, it's voluntary, as opposed to tribal initiations where everybody gets initiated. No, this is, this is exclusive and it's voluntary. It's very limited. Uh, and it's associated with secret knowledge, uh, supernatural knowledge as a rule. Um, in order to gain access to these societies, uh, you need to pay a lot in order to be initiated and you need to pay a lot to advance. These are hierarchical organizations and they typically play dominant roles in the political uh, community political scenes. Uh, important for archaeologists is that they cross cut kinship groups and so they can expand their power beyond kinship groups uh, and that could lead into chiefdoms um, or, and more complex kinds of uh, socio-political organizations. Uh, they've got regional organizations um, the fundamental purpose of these societies as in the ethnographies is pretty much to promote the self-interests of individuals, members. Um, and so you get a lot of aggrandizers that uh, probably created these and were members. Uh, and also one of the most common characteristics is they use uh, intimidation and coercion to uh, enforce their will upon the communities. Uh, the advancement, as I mentioned, initiation advancement is very costly. Uh, one of the typical um, secret societies ethnographically is called the Hamatsa on the Northwest coast here, uh, otherwise known as the cannibal society. That's what Hamatsa means, cannibal. Ham, ham means to eat. Uh, so, um, if anybody's interested, Franz Boas has long uh, disc, uh, uh, descriptions of some of these rituals. Um, for archaeologists, we're very interested in these secret societies because they've got a lot of uh, important material characteristics, uh, including the use of caves, uh, the very small uh, facilities that they use for a limited number of people, uh, and you must realize that the first ritual architecture that we get archeologically are not these big churches. They're not cathedrals. They're not facilities meant for large numbers of people. They are small. They are meant for restricted numbers of people, sometimes maybe 10 or 15. Um, and that is typical of secret societies. Uh, there's a lot of ritual paraphernalia that's needed. They use uh, flutes and whistles and roll roars to, uh, to imitate the sounds of spirits. Um, we get power animal iconographies. That's very important. Sometimes uh, 
human sacrifices and cannibalism. We get special burials. Uh, we get specialist high cost art. We get the strong use of masks to represent the spirits that they invoke, that they bring down and, and manifest in communities. Uh, and they create these ritual regional networks uh, and they use ecstatic experiences as part of the initiations usually, as well as esoteric knowledge like astronomy to um, something that people aspire to gaining as they go up the hierarchies. So in terms of these indicators in the upper Paleolithic, what do we have? We have abundant resources. We have some, some groups that are, some families that are richer than others. Uh, we have regional networks, uh, an exchange of paraphernalia, the exchange of shells. And some of these secret societies use shells as sacred uh, objects. Um, uh, we have the use of caves. Um, and of interest there, in many of these secret societies, the leading members often try to initiate their children, uh, very young children, as members in order to get, give them advantages in the societies and in the political scheme, scheme of things. Um, caves obviously are restricted in terms of access. The art that is in these caves is very expensive. It's high cost in terms of effort, training, skill, time spent, um, and the efforts. Um, there are power animals that uh, we'll see in just a minute. Uh, obviously, there's rituals taking place in these caves. They're for small groups. They're infrequently used. Um, the caves are meant to exclude people rather than to include people. So this is very different from uh, the kind of uh, religion that we get with world religions. Um, and also the, we get the induction of sacred ecstatic experiences in caves. So exclusive numbers, if you don't have caves, you build these structures that are uh, very small, elaborate, uh, with a lot of paraphernalia, ritual paraphernalia, um, like the uh, sites, of, whoops, sorry, whoops, here we go. <laughs> sites on the Russian plain. Uh, we get power animal iconography, um, and that's always been a source of, uh, of um, uh, what, what do I want to say? It's, it's been a, a problem for a lot of archaeologists. The art does not depict the animals that people are hunting. It depicts power animals. It depicts dangerous, powerful animals, bears and bison and uh, lions and rhinoceros. Um, and mammoths. Um, we also get indications of transformation, uh, whether these are masks or whether it's, again, uh, the conceptual transformation into other beings. Uh, we get uh, these really incredible um, carvings and depictions of individuals that are in an altered state or sacred exper ecstatic experience that have transformed themselves. The one on the left is from the, the cave of the Trois Frères from the Upper Paleolithic. The one on the right is from a secret society, ethnographic secret society. Um, I'm not trying to say that there's any connection between the two. I think it, it's coming out of a common uh, base of concepts that we get in secret societies. But uh, the, the, I came across this, I couldn't believe the resemblance. <laughs> um, we get in, musical instruments, they're in caves. That's the main place where they're found, bull roars and flutes and whistles. And these are the same instruments that are used in secret societies ethnographically. Uh, we get esoteric knowledge, people following the phases of the moon down here in the uh, Blanchard, Blanchard uh, plaquette, uh, which is, I think, the best example we have of people following the phases of the moon um, and its relative um, altitude, azimuth in the sky. Also, the, the cave of Lascaux and uh, others 
uh, the entrance is oriented towards the winter solstice right, rising, uh, rising point of the <laughs> winter solstice sun, which shines right into the Salle des Toho uh, and illuminates the back wall. We get the same thing in, in um, other caves as well. Uh, so all of this, I think, is part of the secret uh, esoteric knowledge. We also get um, these evidence of um, very special hidden burials, like Cusack over here. This is this is over a uh, um, hundred meters inside the cave, uh, just isolated on its own in a little cuvette. Um, and then we also get Hillison Tashtit in Israel at the end of the Paleolithic. Um, I think also uh, secret societies were taking place in the Middle East in the, in the Natufian. Um, so these are very difficult to explain. Why would, if you want to bury somebody, why would he go all the way inside the cave here to, to do that? Um, we also get uh, burials in the upper Paleolithic associated with these small dolmens that they called Saint-Germain-la-Rivière. Uh, this body was actually inside the little uh, uh, covered uh, dolmen in the background. Uh, and over here, we get almost exactly the same thing in a secret society burial in, the, in Oceania. Um, we also get some indication for probable human sacrifice. A lot of human bones have cut marks on them. These are skull caps that uh, were... Um, broken and shaped. Um, so, and I'm running out of time here. Uh, we also get some indications of children being in these caves, which is exactly the same thing that we get with secret societies, uh, children of some of the more important um, high ranking individuals. So, sorry to go run through that, but <laughs> so the conclusions about secret societies. Um, we can argue that some upper Paleolithic groups in good environments were complex trans-egalitarian hunting and gathering societies, uh, that secret societies were common among ethnographically um, known uh, complex hunting and gathering societies. So why shouldn't they be common prehistorically uh, among trans-egalitarian societies? Uh, secret societies are based on surplus and wealth. Uh, and there was certainly surplus and wealth in the upper Paleolithic. Secret societies are effective means of establishing inequalities and promoting self-interest, yes. Secret societies are visible archeologically, yes. Uh, some of the most distinctive aspects of upper Paleolithic uh, are also the characteristics of secret societies. And secret societies, I think, were present in the Upper Paleolithic, and they were one of the key strategies used to create socioeconomic inequalities. And I just want to end very quickly in two minutes uh, with saying that I think this is really the basis, the first establishment of the basis for the kinds of religions that we get in later prehistory and the Neolithic and in the, with chiefdoms where you get priests and it's wealth-based, uh, well, has a strong wealth component, uh, strongly tied to politics, right up to the world religions. Uh, and this is where I think it starts. Th they laid the foundations for this. And I think we can see that it's developing from here on out. Prior to this, we got shamanism, which is totally different. Um, in terms of the way it's structured. You, you get some borrowing of shamanistic ideas, transformations and things like that, but uh, basically it's a total transformation. Um, and in uh, your area, I would suggest that the, the site of Toulon 5054 uh, <clears throat> provides a, a really good example, I think, of a candidate for a secret society site, a regional secret society site. You've got wealth, you've got ritual paraphernalia, you've got child inhumations, you've got uh, 
lots of evidence of inequality. It's semi-subterranean, hidden away. It's not out in the open. It's small. Uh, these rooms are extremely small. Uh, limited number of people involved. Uh, I think it has all the characteristics of an emergent secret society taken up to, in, of complex hunting and gathering groups in the archaic leading up to uh, later developments. Oh, and I was gonna, gonna say that uh, there was an article in um, current anthropology about the uh, Santarem archeological and ethnographic data arguing for a regional uh, trans society, ritual society that involved transformations into animals. So again, this is in Brazil. I think that uh, it's another good candidate for uh, secret societies. And in fact, um, this is Chavin de Huantar. Um, again, I would think I, I've suggested that this is yet another level above where on a regional level, we get these regional secret societies that have consolidated power and wealth uh, and created even more complex kinds of polities. Um, I don't know if you're familiar that much with um, Chavin, but um, lots of evidence for psychotropic drugs. Uh, there are tunnels within this, uh, this mound complex, kilometers of tunnels like the one over here on the right, um, that uh, are meant for psychotropic, uh, ecstatic, numinous experiences, I'm convinced, and meeting places, uh, little small rooms off to the side. Uh, we get these power iconographies of these menacing, uh, these, these are not uh, gentle deities that we're looking at. We get the San Pedro cactus over here held by a weird jaguar kind of figure. We get transformation of individuals, uh, these stone sculptured heads, uh, just uh, some of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And a lot of this is coming out of the Amazon. The weird jaguar motifs, the psychotropics. Um, so basically, I think there are lots of links uh, between uh, the the early manifestations of some quote civilization and uh, and these secret societies. So I'd like to end there, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. We thank you, Professor. Any it, it it was fantastic. Well, I can say that, uh, uh, oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to say that everybody was completely focused on you and uh, I could, well, I cannot see everybody, but I can see that everybody was completely uh, perplexed and very happy with your presentation and uh, we could listen to you for hours. So I can't believe that like 45, 50 minutes have been, well, it's crazy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I could, uh, it's a big topic, so I could go on yes, for hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, it, well, we are going to, well, you were already invited to come here again, okay? Here, okay. well, <clears throat> maybe. <laughs> Let me just uh, uh, stop the sharing. Yeah, so now we're here. Let me ask you something. We are talking, of course, you have talked about uh, so much about secret societies and we are in 2021 and people are still talking about secret societies and people are so interested in them and talking and I don't know, being a part of it. And in your opinion, Professor, of course, talking about a, an archaeologist's point of view, what are people, why are people so curious until today due, due to, their, to their supernatural qualities and features, interests, or it's something hidden? Why does it fascinate people so much, secret society, a secret society? Uh, well, the secret societies today are, uh, a bit different from the ones in the past, the tribal secret societies no, I'm yeah. talking about. But uh, they all uh, purport to have the key to some mysteries, you know, the supernatural mm -hmm. keys to, uh, you know, some deeper uh, kind of revelations. And people who are interested in the supernatural want to know what, what the big secret is, what the 
what the uh, nature of the supernatural is, how powerful it is. I mean, there are lots and lots of questions that people have, the unanswered questions. Unanswered. And these societies purport to have the answers. Um, I don't think they do, but <laughs> they, yeah. they, uh, they develop some answers and they use these, um, these uh, initiations to induce uh, these ecstatic, these uh, numerous yeah. experiences. Yeah. Uh, in people, and that these experiences tend to validate what the claims are, uh, mm -hmm. because they are powerful experiences, and they do seem to connect people to different dimensions, uh, different uh, cognitive dimensions, uh, and so they, uh, you know, it, it, if you have this experience with these claims, and, and especially if they're imbued with the iconography and the mythology that the secret societies uh, always are presenting, uh, then this is uh, a very powerful experience for people. And uh, they, they do believe that they have uh, acquired some of the knowledge that uh, these societies have about the supernatural, or some of the secrets they have. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I, I forgot to mention the secret of secret societies is not their existence. Uh, everybody knows that they exist, and a lot of times who the members are. Uh, they even put on public performances. But uh, the secret is the knowledge that uh, that you can acquire by becoming a member and by advancing to the to the top of the hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. The secrets I was, of the universe. Yeah. The secrets of the universe. Uh, you said that the most difficult questions to answer, page 39, and I quote, does the supernatural <laughs> really exist? And if it does, what is it like? Is there any existence after death? Yeah, these remain the most uh, uh, difficult questions to answer. Still, yes. Still, <laughs> still, still. Yeah, well, these societies claim to have answers. You know. Yeah. Uh, there is a question here, uh, Professor, uh, do you have an opinion about Gobekli Tepe? Oh, definitely. Yes, yeah. I, uh, I should have mentioned that I've uh, put out a book on the secret societies uh, and it combines the ethnography and the archaeology mm -hmm. and Gobekli Tepe, I think, is one of the best examples, uh, best candidates, let's say for a, secret, a regional secret society center. Um, it's got all of the power animals, which continues to uh, mystify some of the archeologists in the area. They don't understand why these, the animals are so aggressive. They've got talons, they've got, you know, all these, uh, um, you know, sort of aggressive characteristics. Um, but in terms of secret societies, it, it's, it's it's characteristic it's mm -hmm. it's evident it's it's obvious why these uh, are the animals are being portrayed but also they've got the wealth they've got the manpower uh they've got uh, because you know it takes a lot of and they've got the, the power um the control over the wealth and the manpower to create these centers uh they've got the ritual paraphernalia they've got uh evidence for brewing they've got a lot of human remains among the animal remains too. And nobody's addressed the issue of whether that represents human sacrifices or not as, as manifestations of power. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other reasons for doing, having those things as well. But yes, I think it's, it's, it has all the hallmarks and all the, the buildings in Gobekli Tepe are semi-subterranean as well. So they're, they're hidden. They're not for large numbers of people. Uh, these and um, so, <laughs> I could go on with the comparisons, and I do in sure. the in this book on uh, secret societies. Secret societies, and yeah. uh, there is another question, dear, dear Mr. Hayden. Why Judaism succeeded, where other elite cults failed? Ah. <laughs> that's a that's an issue I haven't. Uh, really considered a lot. Um, yeah, I don't, I think there are historical circumstances um, include, uh, like at the outset, there was a lot more tolerance in Judaism, you know, for the local uh, pagan cults 
Um, <laughs> And it was only really after the Babylonian exodus that, uh, that, and the captivity in Egypt, it was only after the captivity experiences that, um, and the conquest experiences that uh, really became consolidated. So I, I think there's something really uh, involved in that, um, but it's not my area of expertise. It's much later than I, periods I deal with. So sure. I'm, I'm just, um, you yeah, know, giving some superficial impression. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, there is a question here. Uh, how much do we know about secret societies in the, in the Amazon region nowadays? Do you know uh, well, something? I, I think there's a lot that uh, could be done. I think there's a whole study that could be done on secret societies in the Amazon. But it's an area that I don't know very much about. The mm -hmm. uh, the Santarem uh, article was an eye opener for me, but I've always thought that uh, there should be some major secret societies um, in the Amazon that influenced the the early uh, Chavin, the early horizon mm -hmm. in the Andes uh, with Chavin and a lot of the other ritual centers, because mm -hmm. a lot of that influence is coming from the Amazon. Um, but I think the Olmec too. I, the Olmec, I'm pretty convinced, are very similar to the Chavin kind of uh, development uh, with weird jaguars and, uh, you know, basically, I think there were secret societies as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the, what do you think of the theory that the cult of evil spirits are the oldest in the prehistory of religion? What do you think? Is it? Well, um, uh, I just want to pick up on that last question again mm -hmm. uh, and encourage anybody that's interested. I think it'd make a fabulous um, thesis or research project to look into the existence of secret societies in the Amazon and look at their influence uh, all over the place. Um, in terms of the, the uh, what did you call them? Evil, deities? evil, uh, evil spirits. The cult. Spirits. Like, it's the adoration of evil spirits. Kind of the yeah. adoration. Well, as I say, the you know these secret societies, uh, for the most part, the powerful ones. I mean, there's some less powerful ones too that are more defensive, but the real dominant ones, they all um, emphasize these power animals, and they also emphasize the malevolence of the spirits. I mean, this is one of the, the uh, tropes that they have that these spir the spiritual realm is dangerous. And if you unleash the spiritual realm, it will create havoc, it will destroy houses, it will, de it will there will be cannibal spirits that will be unleashed and go around eating people. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you know, night of the zombies in, uh, in today's <laughs> terms. Uh, is that kind of social chaos that it will overwhelm society if those spiritual forces are allowed to run rampant. And the only way that they can be uh, controlled is by the knowledge of the secret society. They are the one, the secret society is the one that's, that's keeping society from disintegrating, from total chaos. And only they can do that. Uh, and they typically have demonstrations of what would happen if these spirits are unleashed. And so they dress up in masks and they run rampant through the villages, destroying mm -hmm. houses, biting people, uh, terrorizing uh, the entire community. As a matter of fact, a lot of the members are called terrorists <laughs> by the ethnographers. Um, extorting money, extorting food, extorting goods. Um, they, it's pretty, uh, but they also do wonder workings like bringing their individuals out to control these spirits. So the, uh, the members of the secret societies come out and they restore order, mm -hmm. they restore calm. Um, so that, you know, if, if these secret societies were the basis for establishing early religions, uh, that is the nature of 
spirits. That is the nature of societies that is, um, that is typical. And as I mentioned before, one of the characteristics of these societies is that they, they try to convince a lot of people through uh, performances and demonstrations of powers uh, that they have this supernatural knowledge, but they also terrorize people. They also coerce people uh, that are reluctant to believe them. Uh, and sometimes they'll even kill people. Yeah. So, and, that, and these same characteristics you can find in the deity or spirit representations in Chavin, uh, in most of the Polynesian uh, deities that reside in the, in the chests of the chiefs, uh, they're all malevolent, they're all dangerous. They're all, you don't wanna provoke them. You don't wanna mess with them. Uh, totally different from the world religions of Buddha and Jesus Christ. Mm, yeah. Totally different. Sure. Uh, I have like a hundred questions, but I'm going to, to pick one or two or three, and then we are going to sum up this. There is a question here in the chat that is being, being sacrificed. The sacrifice was a ritual uh, the 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 person I think the person of being that was being sacrificed uh, was considered a privilege or was the top of the hierarchy or the bottom of the hierarchy the person that was being sacrificed. Well, you probably get some variation. You probably get some people that thought it might be a privilege, but I think most people come from the uh, the lower ranks. Uh, you know, the, uh, the warriors that couldn't defend themselves very well, the poor, uh, the destitute, the uh, people that had, didn't have any social support. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more typical of people that were being sacrificed or captives, you know, military captives. I'm sure there must have been a few people that uh, believed that uh, they were going to meet the deities when they were sacrificed and that they would, you know, have a wonderful afterlife. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there were very many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I would like to talk about the literary traditions. Oh, and then oh, just uh, just a, one, one, a quick addition to that. Uh, one of the ethnographic observations uh, among the Nutka or Nuchalnuth uh, was that uh, the, peer, the poor people, or maybe it was the Belakula, I'm not sure which one, it was, mm. but this was a, a direct quote from one of the ethnographers. He said, the poor people of the community the commoners would always start crying whenever there was a major ritual announced because they knew that one of their members was going to die. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's it all, I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, to read something that is uh, from your book that is fascinating. And then I'm going to ask you the question. It's very uh, uh, short. Many of our literary traditions, uh, including the battles between, of course, good and evil in magical landscapes, owe their immediate origins to Celtic wonder stories, such as the legend of King Arthur. Many other aspects of our daily lives that we perform as a course of habit also owe their origins to the Celts of the pagan Germanic tribes who invaded England in the fifth century of the common era. Can you give some examples of that? Oh, the days of the week. Oh, the days of the week, okay. Yeah, yeah. there's Sunday, uh -huh. there's Moon Day, there's Tuesday, he's God of War, there's Woden's Day, there's Thor's Day, there's Freya's Day, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's... Uh, Easter, going out and hunting, making and uh, hunting for Easter eggs. Well, how is that related to Christianity? It's not. It's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Halloween, Halloween's another one. Yeah, we got lots of, uh, lots of holdovers, lots of superstitions, lots of beliefs, lots of uh, practices that just, especially the holidays, Great. And I would like to ask you the last question that is a oh. more personal one. But yes. uh, what came first, Professor? Because uh, your idea of studying prehistory, archaeology, religion, was everything mixed? What was your major interest? Ah, well, my major interest was, uh, was trying to, well, first of all, being out in the field and doing archaeology. It was uh, 
It's a great experience. I love camping, um, great. <laughs> especially in some of the places where I was, uh, did my first archeology. span um, But uh, in addition to that, just trying to understand what the stones and the bones that uh, I was excavating represented, how they were used, what they were used for, how they were made, uh, and then trying to figure out how they fit into uh, the rest of the culture, what the rest of the culture was like, you know, what uh, people were doing, what, what uh, kinds of societies they represented. And so that's what got me involved in, in, in looking at ethnographies and doing ethnoarchaeology because uh, I really wanted to find out what these traditional societies were like that were producing, you know, with stone tools or, uh, and using stone tools or pottery or, uh, or uh, you know, how, how this feasting, for instance, or how rituals fit into the rest of society, how it all worked together. So. Sure. Uh, and so, what was the most impactful thing that you found? Can you, can you, Point out one or two or three. <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, well, just I didn't find it, but going into the painted yeah. caves in France was certainly a very high impact on me. And um, yeah, and, um, I think uh, doing some excavating in Guatemala, uh, where I found. Well, where the, the, the pots that we were excavating that were 2,000 years old were exactly the same as the ones we found in the markets still Fantastic. being sold today. Fantastic. And uh, it was just, uh, yeah, it was just, <laughs> I think that was a turning point. Yeah, yeah great. So, uh, Professor, thank you so much for being here with us today. It was an honor, it was a pleasure, and you are invited to be here again in Brazil. Well, there are people from many, many cities here, and I think there are people from other countries here that usually uh, come and watch our classes. So I would like to thank you so much. Okay, well, thank it was you. my pleasure. Yeah. Muito obrigada, pessoal. Um grande abraço. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Luis Felipe. Thank you, Brian. Okay. See you. Yeah. See you okay. soon. See Hopefully. you soon. Hopefully. Hopefully. Thank you. Yeah.